Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light from across the vast chasms of space directly into your brain, you're listening to the Spartacast League, and I am Fei Lan, and joining us today are Attica, Castor, and Gackle, so get ready and strap in as tonight we cover the revolution, the big event that happened on the 4th, where all the leftists, Antifa and everybody, got together and forced Donald J. Trump to advocate, or at least that's what the right wing would have thought. But as predicted, the fourth came and went here and it was a snoozer. So basically what happened was the alt-right and conservatives went out to <laughs> went out to a bunch of public parks looking for Antifa, fought each other over what like you know high school kid dressed in all black was Antifa or not, then basically went home. They basically got to have a party. Good for them. They had a nice day out. It was probably the only time that they ever actually got to go outside, to be fair. Okay, so whenever the alt-right falls for its own false flags, like they did with the um, <clears throat> statue in Houston, where it was an alt-right Twitter account imitating an Antifa account, giving like a date and time they were going to destroy the statue. And then like a bunch of alt-right people went out to defend it. And they spent the time fighting each other. Like they, they, they literally started like is sectarianism took hold immediately. The, like the, the authors started fighting with like the alt-right 4chan meme kids. And one guy shot himself in the foot. And that's about how it goes when they respond to their own false flags. I don't get why they continue to do it because it never is beneficial to them, never accomplishes anything. It divides them more than like if they just shut up and sat at home on Twitter. It's because they have no experience really cooperating with each other and with diverse groups. So when they do actually get together, a lot of times uh, they will have these infighting that occurs between you know the various subgroups. But it's not like they're diverse groups. They're all white, old white people or young white people who both want the same thing, a white America. It's not diverse. It's not like when the left has to deal with like ANCOMs and hardcore Marxist Leninists going to like a Black Lives Matter meeting that a bunch of like Dem Socks and Sock Dems go to. And then they have to all struggle not to like try to settle hundred year old feuds. You got something to say to me, Trotsky? Yeah, exactly. Fucking Rosa Killer. Oh, you want to you want to throw fists right now? We can go outside. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, like, the right. What division is there on the right when they all just want the same thing and they all just follow it like sheep? It's literally like they're just so hopped up on Alex Jones to t- testosterone that they can't not point their guns at each other. Alex Jones is giving them second puberty and killing their sperm count. That's what that's what's going on. They're aggressive. The the testosterone's going to their head. They're taking that brain force and oddly not getting very much smarter because of it. I feel like the millennial alt right don't even go through puberty at all. Every time I see a picture of one of them, it's just like, oh, that's the kid who like sat in the back of class and the few times he opened his mouth was really inappropriate and no one really talked to him or acknowledged him. Well, there you go. That's where they came from. So like the school shooter kind of aesthetic, basically. Oh God. (laughs) Aesthetic. I hope that's not what we're calling aesthetic these days. Not like the vapor wave, like the, like the look and feel of something. I remember I was sitting in a college class during one of the college shootings that may have been Virginia tech. But I don't think so, because I was in college in 2010. But like, so anyway, so there was a school shooting that had happened that day at a college, and everyone was nervous. And there was this kid who was by all means nice and normal, but he had the greasy metalhead look and the jacket that he had owned forever, which was all faded and brown. And like that day, like I was hearing whispers of like people at wanting to tell him to leave the class because he looked like the Columbine kids. I felt so bad for him. Yeah, no, I I remember getting a lot of that because I was like a goth in high school too a little bit. And so I did the whole black thing and, and all that. And it was just a cool thing to do, you know, back in the day. 
if you weren't like a jock or whatever. Like that's what you did to have an in-group. So you were basically a young Antifa super soldier. Yeah, I was. I was. I was working a young budding Antifa super soldier. Even even back in the day, I, I will. I will say, like, admittedly, like I've always kind of had a little bit of like, a, you know, like an anarchist like vibe to me. I yeah. I mean, like that's that's basically youth culture. It's it's inherently anarchist. Well, I mean, you're you're young. You're you're budding out. You're exploring the world and. You know, you want to see what boundaries you can push. That's part of, you know, growing up. Yeah, yeah. And I really think that a lot of people, like, don't understand that. And, you know, when they try to buckle down on these kids, those kind of people that are just outright strict to their kids, those are the ones that go wild in college. I saw a BBC article that literally made me scream in real life. The headline was about the, um, the church shooter from the 5th that the alt-right all said, oh, it's the real communist revolution. And, like, fed, fake news spread like wildfire because Google literally promoted a fake news story saying that the guy was Antifa because he had Antifa stuff on his Facebook, which he didn't. Well, Google... All he had to do was go and look at his Facebook. Well, Google promoted the idea that the church shooter, or not the church shooter, the Las Vegas shooter, uh, was Antifa, too, on accident. Yeah, and then they said, oh, we're sorry, we'll fix the algorithm, and then it keeps fucking happening, so no one's doing anything about it, of course, because it gets clicks. Well, but, the Las yeah. Vegas shooter it was even worse, because like they straight up like featured 4chan, and I saw that, too, by the way. Like It, it came up on my, my feed on there. Gotta get that how have revenue. these basement nerds figured out how to like game the algorithm so well? Because that's all they do. That th Their hobbies are ruining society. So, I mean, of course they're experts at it. They need a t-shirt that says that. They need a job. That's what they need. <laughs> they need a, this is a Ironically, <laughs> get a <laughs> job. Tell you, go get a job. <laughs> like, but for real, um, these are people that like, keep talking shit about stuff, and they won't make any effort to improve themselves. So my point, my point was like, the, the article that I saw, the headline was literally... Texas church shooter escaped from mental hospital in 2012. I just screamed because it was like so blatant there that we're not going to call this terrorism because it's terrorism, but it's a white guy. So we are literally going to make the headline. Don't worry, guys. It's just lone wolf mental illness. I just wanted to fucking like bash my phone against a rock over this headline because it was so blatantly everything that everyone's been screaming at the news not to do about these shootings. Well, I mean, even if you want to take the line of this isn't terrorism because it wasn't political, which it doesn't seem like this was actually political. All the evidence so far points to one of the victims was like his mother-in-law and he was having a feud with it. And it's just a very unfortunate circumstance that he chose to lash out against her in this way and kill a bunch of other people in the process because it's it's bad enough that you you kill one person in anger it's it's absolutely horrible that he you know decided to you know take it out against one person like this assuming of course that that's true because we really don't know that much because everything has been made convoluted by the right so that they can pin it on the left because they're just that desperate cuz i mean speaking cuz what happened Two days later, it's just fucking election where they got their asses kicked across the country. Before I get into that, though, like, you still don't need to go around blaming mental illness. Like, the, putting he escaped from a mental hospital is not worthy of the top story headline on BBC News. Like, that's worthy of a mention within a larger article about this person. Like, you don't need to demonize that part, okay? They're trying to justify Jesus it. Christ. They got to get some of those dollars in from people that want to blame all the gun violence on mental illness because they don't want their guns taken away. But then the 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 reverse of that is that they don't want to do anything about mental illness because these same people that are sitting there, you know, crying mental illness, which yes, is a huge problem that we have in this country, don't want to do anything and do everything that they can to defund it at every chance they get. In fact, I believe that Donald Trump had an opportunity to address mental illness and gun laws quite recently and refused to do so. 
Another part to this is that uh, when you like see in the headlines where they when it, it's a white person, they never call them a terrorist. But whenever it's someone who's a slightly darker shade, it's labeled as a terrorist. And you have to remember that most main actually basically all mainstream media is owned by some higher corporation like, you know, MSNBC, Comcast and so on. Like, basically, they're trying to pu push a narrative as narrative as well. And the whole thing that they're, that they're pushing, like trying to kind of glorify white people like in to an extent makes them money especially from conser conservative sources right they're they're big media consumers i mean yeah. but so so is everybody else i mean everybody consumes media of some sort no what i mean is is that like they label things in such a way because the people that are higher up want it that way and it's basically a strategy to it helps them get more money get more revenue in the it's, long run. It's it's almost as if creating controversy produces higher ratings. So you have to sensationalize everything to get those higher ratings so that you get more money. And that's like the same reasoning behind like all of this. Like I read a great article on uh, Slate. It was about uh, – it's uh, it was uh, Anifa is clickbait for conspiracy theorists. And just the title alone, I mean that – that gives it away right there uh, is why the alt right keeps hanging on to this like Antifa revolution thing and why they still keep continuing the story even though nothing happened. Everybody stayed home. Uh, there were just a few people out that were doing the uh, refused fascism protests, which were peaceful. And by and large, most of the left wing protests are peaceful protests. It's actually very rare uh, that. We have things like Black Block out there, you know, throwing stuff at windows. I'm really wondering after those elections, in Virginia especially, because it's such a big state, it's a muscling state for the Democratic Party, defines like their entire strategy. And the slew of trans women, socialists, Black Lives Matter people all won critical political offices in that state. The, the DNC now, even though Perez tried his purge, even though they've been trying to ignore the, the Sanders people within the party. Even though they called Donna Brazile crazy for just even insinuating that Hillary Clinton could have somehow cheated or played dirty or whatever. Exactly. A, a legit socialist. Probably not as socialist as I want. I've been looking through his Twitter. I've been trying to find like, I've been trying to pin down his ideology. And I really can't because it's, you know, professionalized because it's his, you know, his, his campaign Twitter. But here they are, you know, in Virginia, the state that they base a lot of their party strategy on pretty much single handedly being given to socialists and minorities. Right so, on DC's back door. Right. So they have the DNC now has two choices. They accept this takeover. Perez flies into space. Ellison becomes the actual forefront. And they go with this, and the neoliberals just fucking die. Or they try to squash it. They squash it hard. They turn inwards. They destroy the interstate parties. They start trying to purge all of these people who won. Start cutting off access to party aid, which will do nothing but like just hand GOP control over to the entire country. You know, well, on what? top I, of that, I don't that think that eggs, Hillary. Well, on top of that, that begs something like the the 1964 DNC. If they do that after such a siren was was wailed in Virginia, it, it's it's going to be really violent within the party. Like not like legit like sticks and stones and Molotovs violent, except, you know, the, it could be a repeat of the 64 DNC. But like, you know, it's just it's just going to be scummy and cutthroat. And gross. I wouldn't put it past Hillary Clinton and the the party elites to try and and initiate and continue the purge policy B because they were all for it during the election. Hillary Clinton had the bravada to actually steal state funding from the Democratic Party that was slated to go towards state candidates and state elections for her own electoral purposes, which honestly should be illegal. And she should be... Yeah, she did that in my state. I remember being in, in the party and uh, working the campaign 
And I remember like candidates um, complaining about that, like well, their funds were being dried up. Well, you know, you know, Attica, Attica, come on, come on, you're, you're Arizona, come on, get real. You're not going to win Arizona. Just quit crying about it. Give your money to Hillary. She'll be president. It'll work out. Yeah, that's pretty much. And she did come close in the state. Like we were still surprised at how close she came. I mean, but just the just but, the bravada of of Hillary Clinton in in the party that this this was going to be her presidency. Yeah, like her campaign co opted the entire party. She took advantage of what like the DNC being what like two million dollars in debt, if I remember correctly. So she just came in and basically told them what to do. She brought so. the money. She brought the money, and then yeah. basically what was happening is people were. We're donating to her campaign, like really rich people, and they would max out their uh, their personal campaigns, and so they would, you know, these really rich people wouldn't be able to donate any more towards her. So they donated towards basically like super PACs and other institutions, uh, like the Clinton Foundation stuff, like that. But basically, just set up for like electoral purposes. I can't remember the names of the the organizations, but she had like, like three or four big ones. Yeah, I think like Donna Brazil wrote about it, like that general she did for like a uh, political. Yeah, and then yeah, she she wrote about it in the uh, the article for Politico, and then she gets slammed by it uh, by the party elites who accuse her of being a traitor, being crazy, uh, being influenced by Russian propaganda. I mean, like the funny thing about this is everyone knew about this. I mean, this was the whole talk of why Bernie was so slighted by the DNC in the first place. It's it's obvious. It's the scene in in uh, Casablanca where the 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 Nazi enforcer goes in and shuts down the the bar. I'm astonished to find gambling going on in here. You're winning, sir. Thank you. <laughs> it's literally that scene. Yeah, and everything that Hillary Clinton has accused the Trump administration of doing. She's been caught with her pants down doing herself, whether it's taking money from Russia, dirty campaign tricks, hell, even the, the dossier. She supposedly $9 million of what was com used to compile that dossier went towards Russia. $9 million went to Russia. And it's absurd that the same argument, you know, gets hounded at, at the opposition in this particular case when they're both doing it and it's very clear at this point that we need another option in this country yeah exactly and we, we <laughs> definitely not a libertarian yeah I did. like hillary and just like the uh, corporate democrats in general yeah they want to point their fingers at trump but their hands are also caught in the cookie jar you know this is this has been a thing for decades now so let me be the annoying marxist who's defeatist <clears throat> about everything and says yeah this is great but because yeah this is great because after the election last night i am certain i'm 100 percent concrete in my faith that we can turn the democratic party into an actual social democrat party we could go approximately back to something like roosevelt and do keynesianism too which will last 30 years and then fall the hell apart again. And I am I'm certain that we can do this and it'll improve a lot of people's lives, but it's it's not going to overthrow capitalism. The the um Lee Carter, the 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 guy from DSA who won the position, he is for all intents and purposes leftist. He had, you know, he concluded his victory night by singing Solidarity Forever. It is it is not I I don't see it yet saying we need to end capitalism for good i see it begging concessions and oh boy capitalism is gonna have to give its biggest concession ever you know would make what happened in the depression look like you know a stocking stuffer but it's it's gonna be another concession and then it'll be picked apart over the course of 30 40 years to get right back to neoliberalism does the world does the climate have that time to waste before we can just end capitalism move on to socialism and start not constantly trying to struggle with a few barons who own property on a piece of paper so are you just basically hinting at the fact that the clock is ticking and that 
we just may not have enough time for another swing back and forth here uh, because the climate's changing and we might all be dead if we don't do it. Yeah, and, and well, I think that'll definitely be a, the biggest push. I mean, you know, I'd rather go in a left direction than a right direction because looking at the Russian Revolution, of which yesterday was the anniversary, speaking of which, it's no cosmic coincidence that socialists swept to power in one of the most electorally important states in this country on the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution was born out of educated workers saying this is not enough and being shut out of that process. It is that, you know, it, it, building leftist politics to then be pushed over by even more leftist politics, that might be an option, but it, it you know, it, I'm still waiting to hear one of them come to the podium and say, end capitalism in those words, win and then do it. You know, I, I would not be surprised if six months from now we look at this Lee Carter guy and he's been co-opted and subservient to the business interests in that state. When I worked at, when I worked in uh, the CenturyLink Tower, uh, you know, overnight, and I walked around it, I found a legit office with the actual placard on the door with a name. The title was legislative director. This company had a person whose entire purpose it was to co-opt the people's Senate. So and in other words, this guy was a lobbyist? Yeah. And, and blatant, plain as day, worked directly for, you know, this company. That has its roots in the political system so deep that a change of the chess pieces, albeit one hell of a change from a, a corporate Democrat to an actual self-professed socialist, but working within the system, you know, the, this state is built to quash those calls for change. The electoral system, how people are elected, how people vote, what they're able to do in those offices, the power that's divvied up between those offices, so some people are only able to do some stuff for some reasons and others for others, is built so that movements like this get stopped. Now, it, very, very liberal both sides thinking when it was in, enacted in this country, thinking, you know, oh, this will stop, you know, populist rebellions saying, you know, kill all the poor farmers. But that seems to win a hell of a lot more <laughs> than than leftist you know, rebellion saying, hey, let's give people health care. I don't think it's quite working in the way that it was supposed to work. If that's how it was supposed to work, if it wasn't just blatant, oh, yeah, let's just keep all the control for the landowning white males. So things in this country have been deconstructed over time, over centuries. But that basic fact of every challenge to capital, every time it swept into office, every time it did it in the 30s, every time it did it in the 60s, and it's doing it again now, it gets it declawed and defanged. So what we need to do in this particular instance, then, is we need to make sure that the left has ground game, that we're not only just taking offices uh, that you know we are visible in the streets and I don't necessarily mean protesting I mean getting out there and organizing your workplace that kind of thing uh, making sure that you're out there uh, participating in in goodwill programs such as you know like the food programs like uh, volunteer in a food kitchen that kind of thing getting service out to people uh, that is yeah. extremely crucial in creating that ground game and that network that leftism thrives in and as soon as we forget that as soon as we abandon that uh the movement will kind of peter out the thing with socialism in itself it, it's inherently focused on the community it's focused on people for it to kind of take hold and for people to be somewhat swayed from what they've been told all their lives by what's more or less just propaganda over the ages is that you need some kind of infrastructure of like leftists actually doing things in their com communities like doing things for the homeless doing like maybe even helping at a I don't forget, or soup kitchen or something like that helping to feed the poor stuff like that and people listening i'm familiar with will be like huh what how does that build power those people don't vote that's not going and talking to your representative huh but in the 60s, that didn't happen because labor unions were a core part of Keynesian economics. You know, it, it was the method through which profit from capital was pressed downwards to labor as a means to create a middle class. So leftists, that wasn't really in their thinking. In the 60s, it was more a rebellion against general repressive boredom. 
in the 30s, you had a very strong labor movement and a very strong uh, electoral political movement that resulted in Roosevelt and things like the Tennessee Valley Authority and all of these federal work programs that was the most left this country had ever seen. And still, you look at cities with buildings that were built out of those programs and nothing compares to them. Like, I would take that instantly, but I would take it with the knowledge that, you know, that it's not it's not socialism. It's not any capitalism. It's it's a huge, ginormous band-aid and concession. So if we just focus on electoral politics, we're dead for sure. If we focus on electoral politics and organizing the workplace in our communities, we might still be dead. You know, I read somewhere once a leftist complaining about the left, because that's what a lot of leftists spend their time doing, complaining that, you know, since the October Revolution, the left hasn't even gotten anywhere close to even, you know, like a Paris commune. We haven't even gotten a city, even a small city, to throw their arms up and collectivize and communalize, kick their capitalists out, and institute socialism, even just on their city level, even though it's doomed to be quashed and be rolled over with tanks, like the Paris Commune was, they didn't have tanks, but same deal. We haven't even gotten that far. Like we, we that, that needs to be a focus. Like we need to start having Paris communes. We need to start having that happen in cities and small towns and neighborhoods that just kick out their capitalists and just decide to collectivize. Even though it will be smashed, it will send such a message of fear through capital and, and it will, I think, prove to be uncontrollable in the long run. And interestingly enough, I live in geographically probably one of the best states to actually uh, have like a county or whatever cleave off and uh, become socialist. But there's another problem to that, though, is that like this probably wouldn't happen soon, though. Like things aren't quote unquote bad enough for people to or, like things aren't quote unquote bad enough yet for people to uh, like stand up and like secede into their own socialist society because they're afraid of repercussion like. Back in the day, back during the Paris Commune, they had muskets and shit. But today, like, we have tanks, we have things, we have, we have like, there are drones. But I, like, I've people never, are, are I've terrified never of, of, like, the government. You, you know what? They're, they're terrified like, of mil- the modern military force. Like, the thing that's keeping people from doing this is fear of being, the like, thing, The thing about, about that argument is that... People then were just as much afraid of muskets because muskets were all they had, as much as we're afraid of drones and tanks. The, that power of fear, fear was just as coercive because at the time that was a tippity top of technology. Hey, keep in, keep in uh, mind, though, no, no, like, I, I think there's there's a big difference. It, it's basically you going against like the world hegemon. Like You definitely cannot, as an American citizen, overthrow the government. It, it, it's, it's, it's not possible. I mean, just for a comparison, even though... Well, I mean, like, of, of course, like America, we defeated the world's strongest empire at the time, which was like uh, Great Britain. The English could not wipe out an entire city with one bomb at the time, you know, just to say. So I, I think we should definitely take the if you want if we want to change America for the great, I mean, uh, for the better, we should definitely do it through elections. We should be evolutionaries, not revolutionaries. But that always gets co-opted 100 percent of the time. So. Here's my my only problem with that is is that if if you if we were to go with that particular route though uh, we at least need to concede that election reform is needed in the United States on a scale that would basically be a revolution at that point. Yeah, yeah. And the only and the only way that that is happening is if cities have the threat of going full Paris Commune. The only way that concession is coming from capital, a complete makeover of the electoral system in a way that they would most likely lose all or almost all of their control over it, would be if literal cities would go into revolt. Secession. I don't necessarily think, yeah, I don't necessarily think that it's a question of are things bad enough? Like I said earlier, the Bolshevik Revolution was a response to the betrayal of the attempts to solve it politically through elections. And I think we're barreling down a road in this country where that would look to become a viable option if this election, if, if this electoral route that is simultaneously being taken alongside the labor union route, if that electoral route fails, 
then it, you know, it's up to the American Soviets. Like, it is up to those labor unions to do that. And this is like 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Like, like, like this isn't going to happen overnight. You know what? I honestly feel that if Americans deep in, in the history, this is the same country that revolted and had farmers and peasants revolts in its early history because the tax on whiskey was too high. And I really think that like if if our great, great, great grandparents, uh, you know, were able to get their their knickers in a wad over you know, a little bit extra on the whiskey, then I, I think that we should, you know, we're able and capable more than enough to, you know, go out there and make a little noise to make things better in this country. Especially if it's, if it's in our own, not, not just interest, but survival to do it. That is the, that is the key here. In the thirties, it wasn't survival. The oh, I would argue it was. I mean, the Great Depression was, it, there's a reason it's called the Great Depression. <clears throat> yes, but, but the environment wasn't collapsing. Um, there were no atom bombs that were threatening to blow up the world. You weren't seeing huge systemic, uh, systemic death. You were seeing capitalism falling apart. But you weren't looking at the ocean and saying there aren't going to be fish living in this in a hundred years. In the sixties, you weren't seeing that. The sixties, things things were booming. There was plenty of money. It would have been one of those revolutions that happened because there is so much good and so much money and so much opportunity floating around that, like the bourgeois did with feudalism, just grab it. It's mine now. Behead the king. Now it is a matter of global survival. And what I'm seeing is that this revolt is global. In the past year alone, there's been, you know, riots in the United States, rebellion in Catalonia, outright armed insurrection in Kashmir. The farmers in China are always on the point of rebelling. It, 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 it is sort of the fulfillment of that conclusion that of this being a global movement because the globe is industrialized now. I, I do have I do have some hope uh, in in terms of you know the direction the United States is going here. Uh, simply just because in terms of the DNC, even if it doesn't work out with the DNC, even if they do try to purge, I don't think that there is no stopping uh, the movement at this point. Uh, it's it's picked up no, enough it's momentum. Like- it's gonna it's gonna snowball. And I think we saw this because uh, just before um, Halloween, uh, the two big labor unions announced in the United States that we need a third party in the United States. So they're ti- they 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 literally just said that they were tired of the lesser of two evils politics. They don't want to have nothing to do with it, and they're seeking out progressives uh, to create a new labor party in the United States. And if this kicks off, this could be the big thing in the United States. This could be what replaces the Democratic Party. Let's hope and that's so, happened kid. before. Let's Dude. hope so, because like the the Democratic Party is honestly like almost just as bad as the Republican Party. Like they're they're it's they're they're bad. <laughs> they don't stand for anything. They they're willing to compromise with everything and anything that the uh, Republicans propose. I'm I'm pissed that Jeff Flake is not running again. Because the person who's slated to run for the Democratic Party is a congresswoman named Kristen Cinema, who legit as her rule, her own personal rule, she will not sign or, or she she will not um, endorse any legislation that does not have a Republican co-endorsement. Flat out is going to lose and we are going to get a legit all right chud as senator. See this in is this is this That's attitude the- of wanting to fail at this point. I mean, it wouldn't make any difference because they both basically carry out the same acts in whoever's running what legislation. Like, it's like, all it's, neoliberal policies. Yeah, that's the but, thing. It's all neoliberalism, and it's a cancer upon our society, basically. Kristen Cinema wouldn't be any different from Jeff Flake. It'd just be a bit of a smile, a diver, more diverse smiley face. But that's not going to win against whatever eventual Bannonite alt right chud is drugged up, dragged up from the sewers of Phoenix, Arizona to go stand in place of Jeff Flake. 
But yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is this is known that the Democratic Party wants to lose because they desperately they they cannot break away from neoliberalism because it's where it gets all its funding. And if they ran socialists, they wouldn't be able to give them any money because they'd lose all their funding. So they're in a catch twenty two. And yet, um, Bernie Sanders almost almost won the primary. And I think without those dirty tricks, he would have won. And if he would have won the primary, oh, yeah, I don't. Won. I I don't think that would, we would have, have a won. Trump president. We wouldn't. But he would have run without party funds. He would have been tied to it, which was his whole shtick, his whole thing. I shouldn't call it a shtick because it was way more than a shtick. But again, Lee Carter, the guy who won in the Virginia State House, ran without taking any money from the DNC. So it's possible, but like the DNC won't give you money because they can't because they'll lose all the funding if they move away from neoliberalism. It is it is a zombie party, and yeah, it could be a labor union party that kicks it over. The uh, it's a very similar thing happened with the Whig party. It just sort of became obsolete and it dissolved. You know that has been something that's happened once before in American politics when a party just becomes irrelevant. Uh, and the things that it stood for, nobody wants, but it's such an old entrenched party that it can't just change. It just sort of collapses overnight and its members uh, fold into different cloths. So it, ironically, if we, if we were to have this conversation 20 years ago, you we would have been discussing how the Republicans were the, the Whigs and that how George W. Bush was probably going to be the last of the uh, Republican presidents. Four, eight years, we might have, like, the Democratic Party that's stronger than ever. I don't know. But it has happened before that parties that lose their way, lose purpose, though it's only happened once, uh, disintegrate almost overnight over a very critical issue. The weak party disintegrated over slavery. It couldn't be ignored anymore. They, they, they divided itself among pro-slavery and anti-slavery, and the anti-slavery wing became the Republicans and won the next election. So when, when there is that critical impasse in a country of changing an entire economic model because it's inhumane and the party can't get off of its drug, it dies. You know, so I can all, see that. You know what was really but, funny about this whole Labor Party thing, though, is that the Democrats, of course, immediately had a response to it. Uh, they, they came out later and said, no, we're going to work with the unions. Co-opt, co-opt, co-opt. My God, click the emergency button. Co-opt it now, now, now. Yeah, so as soon as uh, the labor unions and, and whatnot come out and say that they want a third party, uh, then they just go throw Keith Ellison over there and say, hey, you know, we'd like to work with you guys. It, as much as I, I'll be fair, okay, I, I like Keith Ellison as for, for what he is, that he is a member of the Democratic Party who is progressive and I can appreciate that. Uh, however, I don't think that Keith Ellison has the solution for this country. No, this this, con this country is in a position to end up with a Lenin or a Hitler. Yeah, this country is at such an impasse and its political party is so defunct that it is, it, you know, the person who leads it could come from nowhere. We probably will be blindsided, just like we were all blindsided with Trump. I don't think in a million years that uh, that Trump would have been elected four years ago. The 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 person with the solution is going to come out of nowhere. That solution, you know, I think, could still possibly be some really really scary fascistic crap. Here's the thing, though, with Trump being elected, like as terrible and as horrible as he is. Maybe this is what we needed for people to actually wake up and realize that, like, the Democrats aren't really the good guys either. If Trump, yeah. like, say, if Hillary or even say if Bernie was running and got elected, we'd still be facing huge problems with basically our culture being very heavily geared towards neoliberalism. But and because, then, because then, of Trump, now people are questioning this. Yeah, and, you know, Sanders would have won, and then he would have had the hardest time getting anything done because it would have been hamstrung by his own party. Basically, like there, there, there was a crisis coming either way, no matter what. There's probably more crises coming. I mean, God, yesterday gives me so much hope. And I know that we can get, you know, back to the point of there being a social Democrat part, party in this country. I'm really kind of hoping that what happened yesterday continues, that this is just the preview of what's to come in 2018. Yeah, yeah like, like everyone's predicting that the Democrats are going to get their ass kicked and wiped off the face of the country. 
But that's because they're looking at the statistics of the people that the Democratic Party says they're going to run. This Lee Carter guy didn't take any party money, didn't use any party resources, won his primary, and then won the seat. So there's going to be 20,000 Lee Carters in 2018 who are going to be running essentially as a third party in Democrat name only as socialists, well, as social Democrats, uh, without any party materials and winning. Let's hope that it keeps going, but I'm, I have a feeling that like this is going to be like something that's going to transition over in one election cycle. The Democrats are going to kick and scream for like at least at least a decade. Oh God! Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, I mean, the, no. as long as the the party elite are there, that rot is going to exist, and that's exactly what it is. It's it's political rot. And actually, I think the Republican Party might be a bit number two because, like, people dislike them both for the same reasons. They both and, do do whatever they, they're upset and about, and that is and, so dangerous because that breeds an apathy of both sides are bad. And I can't really care about anything because there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Eat Arby's. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what is happening. Like, both parties are basically bought and owned by Wall Street or whatever big conglomerate or lobbies for them. And it, they don't represent the people anymore. They, and people, when they go to vote, they have a choice between these two f- forces that are basically doing the same shit. And there's no real input from the people in their government. I'm just hoping that this stuff does gain traction, but I'm thinking that also maybe the Republican Party's kind of lim- their time is limited too. Because like you're saying that Bush was going to be the last Republican president, but Trump kind didn't of Trump kind of run on he's not like a quote unquote traditional Republican. He he kind of yeah. ran on the whole outside the establishment whole spiel, even though that was basically yeah that's a, the like, party bullshit. trying to reinvent itself. They 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 tried to reinvent themselves and then doubled down. <laughs> So, so the real politics in this country is happening between the left alliance of labor unions and socialists and a neo-fascist man-child regime. And that's not just Trump, the man-child. Like, they're all man-children. Right. And so um, if, you, if you really want to do something in this country, go out there and start organizing your workplace. Start start at least despooking it. Holy shit. I have been doing my best. Now, I have a really solitary... Um, position i kind of wish i was still working in a job like the sandwich shop i worked in where there was a lot of teamwork and i could do a lot of despooking and it's it's hard work i i've been doing the same thing myself i recently actually joined the iww uh so that i could go out there and and help people organize their workplaces and i am doing that right now uh in my current place of work you're not going to say where you work because leftists will flash the shit out of you (laughs) Now, but that's still so foreboding when both the Democrat, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are for all intents and purposes dead. And these increasingly contentious elections, the aftermath of which keeps resulting in violence, is between groups so dynamically opposed as legit socialists and legit fascists. That's not something that can be resolved in electoral politics. Well, what direction did you really think? that the right-wing party was going to take Uh, because as moderate sounding as the Republican party was maybe 20 years ago, they're not going that direction anymore. And it's, it's very clear that they're ushering in and grooming a youth of people to come in that are far more right-wing than I would argue than much of who they are replacing. Well, of course, and my point is that that can't – such a division like that is not going to be able to be solved through electoral politics. I don't think this country can avoid a revolt at this point. No matter how many socialists win, there's going to be a revolt on one side or another. Yeah, like if – I kind of have a feeling that if there is more socialist people in government, we're going to see a lot more – we're going to see even more terrorism from the right. They already, they're already heavily armed, and unfortunately, a lot of leftists – aren't really as armed but it's good news that leftists are the ones who are taking the state it, it, look at virginia if that can be assumed to be a pattern then you know there you go the last time this happened the left controlled the state the right controlled the rebellion and the rebellion was crushed so here's here's the thing though is that you remember when we said oh yeah we should definitely read trotsky which by the way we we are going to uh, that's not put off forever 
remember this whole argument that uh, that Trotsky made that communi- er, communism doesn't benefit from terrorism and individual action. The same is true for right wing violence. It, it's not going to benefit the right wing to be outwardly violent. It's just going to isolate themselves into an ever shrinking group because most people are going to look at that and they're not going to want anything to do with that because any decent person knows to condemn that. And that means that all you really have to do is continue to pin it saying this is right-wing violence. This is right-wing terrorism. This is right-wing terrorism. This is right-wing terrorism. Shut up, centrist. This is right-wing terrorism. Exactly. Um, you know, like, like when, but, you, but, when you point out events like the, uh, like the Charleston church <clears throat> shooting, not, not the one that happened in Texas the other day, but the Charleston one with Dylan right. Roof, point out that's right-wing terrorism right there. And nobody that is a decent person nobody's going to justify the murder of elderly people and children yeah the, 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 the nazis didn't start executing people in the street until they already like had the state exactly and the nazis don't entirely have the state yet trump hasn't been able to get anything done in a way, we dodged a bullet with him because he hasn't been able to get anything done because he's an idiot. Well, because he's luckily incompetent. But there's something that I was watching on from a, or that I think came from a Jimmy Dore show episode, but it was basically that if Trump didn't, didn't get elected and if Hillary got elected, like we would have got something worse than Trump in 2020 or 2024. We would right, have got it's just, something it's coming worse down the than line. Trump and someone who's actually competent. Like yeah, Trump's so been coming for a while. Yeah, well, this thought was, it was Trump, someone who's basically. Could you imagine if it was somebody that was both malevolent and competent? There was. Uh, I don't know. Like, can, can Americans do malevolent and incompetent? Uh, malevolent and competent? Like, you look at all of our villains, and they're either one or the other. <laughs> um, I mean, Ronald I don't Reagan? think it's impossible to be honest. Like. My biggest fear would be a Le Pen for the United States because you, I mean, the right and even like most people who do vote Democrat, if they saw someone like that, they would downplay every single thing that she said and what her party had done. That's definitely something that I see that is possible, and that that is something that frightens me. Trump was just someone. He was a he. He um he definitely did ride on the uh on on the 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 mood of the United States right now. Like a, a lot of people are of of course um upset with the status quo he's an idiot so he can't get anything done someone like le pen or someone like richard spencer who actually uh not not to give him like any points or anything but someone who is at least intelligent he has a brain he could definitely do some damage so the one big thing here that liberals really need to take and they need to stop doing is they need to stop calling the opposition idiots Quit trying to, you know, play them as as fools or whatever, uh, because it is dangerous. Uh, because yeah, some of these people are are fools and jokers. But on the other hand, a lot of these people out there that are are looking to seek power. Well, you, you know what? It's not even it's not even liberals downplaying them. Like it's oh well, they're never going to get power. It's them always being like, oh well, they have a point on this. Like, why would you ever do that? With someone who literally wants to create like an ethno state and get rid of you, who you you're actually gay, why would you ever say, "Oh, someone like Richard Spencer has a good point on anything"? That's so absurd. Like, what's up with this apologetics from the liberals? It uh, liberals turn politics into um, it's an intellectual game. It's all about the marketplace of ideas, right, guys? And it's a show. It's a show. I mean. What was it? I was talking about, funny enough, in the leftist for chat, we are talking about sports and soccer and football, which I don't know why I was even talking about that, because I don't know anything. But I was like, so, so sports to me feels really redundant. Like, it, it feels really redundant whether, you know, bird mascot team wins or... or, or insensitive yeah. racist mascot team wins. Did all these the same thing. Like, what, wouldn't, wouldn't it be fun if the teams were based on ideologies right like we will you know pit pit the liberal team against the marxist leninist team and then someone said like well this is exactly how liberals think about politics and i'm like well, 
shit, yeah, you're right. Except it's not relegated to like the harmlessness of a field of grass. It involves laws that say whether we live or die. So it is treated like a show. And you see liberals do this all the time where they like try to fit the narrative, the political narrative into like, it's just like this time in Harry Potter or whatever. It, like they're all in some fucking weird fantasy land. And it's made these people unable to think critically, to apply these positions to real world events that impact themselves. And that's why they're able to f do apologetics. Like he, he has a point, like you have to concede that to keep the show going. Like that's your line. I think a lot of the liberals, they don't understand how politics directly affects them. Same thing with the Republicans, of course, like um, you always hear after like one of these mass shootings, this isn't an issue of gun control. This is an issue of mental illness, right? And you even heard like Trump saying this, Donald Trump, you you you're trying to get rid of like a afford, like a affordable health care right things that directly help people who suffer from mental illness you're making it to where they can't get the help that they need and not only that you made it to where people who do like who are mentally ill I forget, what is it well, well like, no... they can get a gun now if i remember correctly like something something with them now being able to get a gun you know he basically <laughs> admitted in, in this entire facade that he is ca helping cause the problem basically yeah it's like he doesn't he he doesn't really give a shit because it's not affecting him directly and it's that's really how politics works in this country the people who vote and make policies never make the policies about anything that could possibly affect themselves the voting class in this country is made up of people who are so economically isolated from the real world that they get to treat the collapse of american democracy like a scene in harry potter well it's a dog and, and pony show yeah so you get this perfection of double think where people are able to simultaneously hold two completely opposing thoughts in their head and it doesn't cancel out you can simultaneously, as a Republican or a liberal, hold in your head, this isn't terrorism, this is mental illness, and we should do something about that, and we need to get rid of Obamacare because it's evil socialism. And those two ideas make sense in your head. The, the, logic, the logical ability to realize, wait, those two cancel out, those don't make any sense, is obliterated in most of the voting population. But it's not in the working class. Because we experience this day-to-day, -day, these inconsistencies within capitalism, and it, we've grown used to it, but it, it hasn't, we haven't just l accepted it. But then we don't vote, because policies never come up in which we have a stake in, other than how we're going to get shafted. And that's why we're gerrymandered out of districts and into corners of districts where our votes don't accomplish anything, so we can just continue to get shafted. So the big question is, is where do we go from here? And I think the answer at this point is, well, the ground game. We need to get on the ground. We need to organize our workplaces. We need to be present in our communities. People need to know who we are, what we stand for, uh, because if they don't know, they're not going to accept the socialist so, you know, solution as It's going to be a scary buzzword. It's going to be a scary buzzword for them, like you said, that is, at best, it'll it'll be looked at as some, like, academian thought exercise or something like that. And I am so glad that it's dying. That is, like, the biggest thing that has to die about the misconceptions of the left and socialism. It is, it's, it's, oh, it's only this thing that's pursued by the Zizix and the Chomskys of the world. The people right. who are so privileged to go to MIT and they get to sit on their ass and eat cake and think about, oh, what if the world was? Exactly. And, and, you, and, and the big thing is, is how, how many people in, in this particular show right now, how many of you guys are college professors or, or whatever? Exactly. Like, well, I, yeah. I'm going to admit, like, I... I'll admit it. I dropped out of college, and I probably shouldn't have, but I couldn't afford to go. I did too. It was my 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 father was literally farming me for my Pell Grant, and when it ran out, he just kicked me out, and then I had right. to drop out. I was going to university, but then I had to drop out because I couldn't afford rent. But the thing is, is I never stopped learning. I, I exactly. never stopped reading and and analyzing the world, and that's what really matters. And so this this whole idea that like the left is exclusively like this like big ache head thing, no, that's not even close. That's something that maybe that's something that developed in the '60s, 
and it was yet another way it was right. co-opted. Yeah, it was a way that was co-opted in the sixties. As naz bully as this might sound, and as much of a dorky white guy that this Lee Carter guy looks like, he's sort of perfect in exactly what we need because he's he's very normal looking, very plain. Has like the good boy haircut. Looks like he would be an RNC staffer, and yet he's a socialist. So th- basically, and- let me explain this to you. Uh, so if Bernie Sanders is Ron Paul, this guy is Justin Amash, is what you're saying. I know that name. I can't put a face to it. He's kind of like a hip Republican, libertarian type. Uh, I, I believe he's from uh, no, Michigan. No, I'm, 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 I'm saying that. This Lee Carter guy. Uh, Basically, the point I want to get to is that the more beefy, big bearded, hardworking looking guys that you would look at and assume, oh, that guy's a Republican chud, come out and say they're communists and start running for office, the better. That obliterates the idea that leftism is just this lofty thing for eggheads. Right. But at the same time, to keep that from going down a road of like toxic masculinity and just, you know, chucking all the minorities off the bus. It needs to be cleaved. The, the idea of masculinity needs to be cleaved into. You need you need to create this culture of thought in which, yeah, I can be a guy, and this is something I'm I'm going through. I've become more masculine since I've taken a left turn because it it has freed me from the box of masculinity is defined by everything that it's not. Masculinity is not feminine. It, ma- ma- being masculine is being not feminine. Being masculine is being not gay. Being masculine is being, you know, not brown. Y- you need to cleave that to where, like, you need to have these big, burly union dudes working and getting elected alongside trans women it, it, to completely obliterate the idea of masculinity being defined by what it isn't and making it defined by what it is. Because then things don't become a threat to masculinity. Feminism and homosexuality and all those things becoming normal and that changing because masculinity is then defined by what it it isn't, that then redefines masculinity. And that's where the reactionary threat comes from of the incels and the 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 gay hate and and the you know the hate and murder of trans people. Because masculinity right now is completely defined by what it isn't. They're afraid that that they're going to be treated like a woman. Right, and and that and that their masculinity is going to be completely trampled, right? Because it's entirely defined by everyone else around them. And I'm defining it for myself, and if you can cleave those ideas in two, then you can have as many big burly white union dudes running as communists and not have it end up shoving out feminists and and trans women from like a toxic toxic masculinity aspect especially if you can have them be like side by side with the trans women and actually say stuff like you know i i'm i'm very proud to be a guy and i like being a guy and i like being masculine but you know i don't have to stop other people from being feminine or from being masculine like if that can be made into a statement if that can be said then that that's one whole problem that doesn't even have to be dealt with anymore of it, the eggheadiness of the left. And then the other faucet of this, this whole thing is that what this does is this will attract more people into the party because people will see that, uh, well, this is, it's, it's not masculine inherently to, to be fascist or, or whatever, because that's, right. that's why a lot of people join it or like they'll, they'll see it's, it's protecting my traditional culture and, and whatever. And then they're going to find out, well, that's not true either. Yeah. The only way that the left could have taken control of Central South America and, and the Caribbean is through someone like Che and Castro. Now, they turned around and that toxic masculinity killed off minorities and gay people within their country because just the machismo was out of control because it didn't separate the idea of masculinity being defined by everything that it isn't. But the, now, you know, you've got, what's it, Castro's daughter, who's going to probably be the next leader of Cuba, is like one of the biggest trans campaigners in the world. Yeah. Like, the other thing is, is like, says this was a, that was a big mistake. We have to not do that again. <laughs> exactly. It, and you, and here's, here's the thing about that, that, 
Castro and even Shay, Shay at the end of his life recanted a lot of the stuff that he, he did. Like he, he did realize that murdering gay people was wrong and you can't go back and change it. And he, he realized this. Yeah. And, and that's another hole that the left needs to not fall down into because the big motivation, the justification for doing that to gay people was that gay people was just a result of what bourgeois capitalism and an endless search for something new with pizzazz and that you had to get rid of the gay people to get rid of capitalism because it was just so culturally tied to it. So the whole of the left needs to not go down is the what is culturally bourgeois keep keep in mind that this also occurred in in a very in very religious societies as well so there True. was like yeah. a conservative religious element to this as but this well this happened in in Russia too like this hap- this happened under the Soviet oh, Union the, as the well o- as that orthodox there was this talk of the Orthodox religion was very heavily against that as well. So like, this kind of stuff isn't surprising. This is how they won people that would normally be conservatives over. And it was a bad yeah. tactic. And it was admitted it was a bad tactic. And going forward, it's something that we should never pursue again, ever. Yeah. We, we, we can't go around assigning this is bourgeois culture, that's proletarian culture. Like these are clearly defined by economic positions of power and wealth and ability to exploit. This is, you know, wearing a gold necklace isn't bourgeois culture. <laughs> Having a lifted truck is not proletarian culture. There's just, there's no such thing. There's things that are reinforced by property values and property relations. Yeah, proletarians are probably going to be more likely to have a bunch of holes in their shirt. Yeah, can, can we like jack up all the workers' trucks? <laughs> yeah, oh, we need to destroy capitalism and destroy bourgeois culture. I, I, I <laughs> really think if, truck. it's the only thing manufactured now. Exactly. Like it's it's gonna be Chevys and F three fifty XL extended cabs. With giant hammer and sickles painted exactly. on the sides. They're gonna be trucks so big that uh goat hull will not be able to climb in them. <laughs> <laughs> Which ironically is not that big of a truck, <laughs> and we could change the national anthem to "Cruise" by Florida Georgia Line. And with that, dear Barksus, with the world in chaos today, we'll leave you with that joke. Good night and good luck. <laughs>